If scholars had to pick two writers who've had the most impact on speculative fiction in the last 50 years, they would most likely pick J.R.R. Tolkien and H.P. Lovecraft. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings has essentially redefined epic fantasy, and it's hard to imagine modern fantasy literature without him. Meanwhile, Lovecraft's Strange Tales of Cosmic Horror had made him America's most influential horror writer since Edgar Allan Poe. What's equally interesting is that although they wrote very different kinds of stories, Tolkien and Lovecraft both wrote about a particular idea, dread, in the face of, in the face of seemingly all-powerful evil. Lovecraft explored this idea in various short stories, most notably in his piece, The Call of Cthulhu. Meanwhile, Tolkien explored this idea throughout his Lord of the Rings books, most notably in The Fellowship of the Ring. For context's sake, let's summarize the, I'm going to summarize these two stories. In The Call of Cthulhu, a scholar named Francis Whalen Thurston inherits some belongings from his granduncle, a language expert who recently died in bizarre circumstances. One of these belongings is a clay plaque with a strange image on it. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a deceased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination builds simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it is the general outline of the whole thing which made it most shockingly frightful. Now, Thurston learns this plaque was made by an artist after having a nightmare in March 1925. Files show that Thurston's uncle interviewed the artist and other people about their dreams and found they all had nightmares from February to April of 1925. A collection of newspaper clippings his uncle collected show strange events happening during that same period. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise, a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America, where a fanatic deduces a dire future from visions he has seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes and masks for some glorious fulfillment which never arrives, whilst items from India speak guardedly of serious native unrest toward the end of March. Thurston finds other files about two cults which both have sculptures of this monster. The cultists call the monster Cthulhu, a godlike being in a pantheon known as the Great Old Ones. The Great Old Ones are gone, but not dead. They sleep, waiting for a resurgence. And both cultists use a chant, which translates as the following. In his house at Rylea, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. In other words, Cthulhu sleeps, but he will rise again. And finally, Thurston finds an account by a sailor who visited an island in March 1925. The sailor and his crew found an ancient city on the island and accidentally released a huge tentacle-covered monster. Now moving on to the Fellowship of the Ring. In this book, Bilbo Baggins leaves his home for a permanent holiday and he gives everything to his nephew Frodo, including a magic ring he got in his early adventures mentioned in The Hobbit. Bilbo's friend Gandalf advises Frodo not to use this ring. It may have powers beyond anything Bilbo realized. Years pass, and Frodo talks with anyone who visits his, his area, the Shire, to find out what's going on in the rest of the world of Middle-earth. Some dwarves give him information that suggests evil forces are rising. The Dark Tower had been rebuilt, it was said. From there, power was spreading far and wide. And away far east and south, there were wars and growing fear. Orcs were multiplying again in the mountains. Trolls were abroad, no longer dull-witted, but cunning and armed with dreadful weapons. And there were murmured hints of creatures more terrible than all these, but they had no name. Gandalf visits Frodo again and tells him the Dark Lord Sauron is behind this rising evil. And Sauron only needs one last thing, a magic ring he forged centuries ago. Gandalf then takes Frodo's ring, throws it into a fire, and the heat shows words that are on the, on the ring. The words translate as the following. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, bind them. These words belong to an old poem. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men, doomed to die. 
one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness find them, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Frodo's magic ring is this one ring. The ring Sauron made especially for himself, and if he gets it again, he will become unbeatable. Now these summaries show that although the Colin Cthulhu and the Fellowship of the Ring are clearly different stories, they have some striking similarities. In both cases, an innocent person inherits an object from their, from their uncle, an object connected to an evil being. And in both cases, that evil being has been dormant, but is coming back. Frodo learns that Sauron disappeared briefly after the White Wizard Council destroyed his Mirkwood fortress, but he showed up again in Mordor. Meanwhile, Thurston learns that Cthulhu is hibernating, but he'll wake up, and if the sailor is correct, it appears he has. In both cases, the innocent person also learns they may have even gained the evil being's attention. Gandalf tells Frodo that Sauron's not just looking for the ring, he has a clue as to who currently has it. And meanwhile, Thurston learns that anyone who learns too much about Cthulhu tends to die in bizarre circumstances, like his granduncle. And in, and in finally, in both cases, it's very clear the innocent person has no way they can directly face this threat. They can't fight, they can't fake, go face to face and defeat this evil being. However, Frodo and Thurston ultimately make very different choices about how they react to the situations. Thurston gets scared by what he learns about Cthulhu and ultimately wishes he'd never found out anything in the first place. He concludes ignorance in general is even better. Hmm. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. In contrast, Frodo gets scared by what Gandalf tells him, but he doesn't resent the fact that Gandalf told it to him. In fact, this is how he reacts after Gandalf's told him everything about the ring. Whoa, said Gandalf at last. What are you thinking about? Have you decided what to do? No, answered Frodo, going back to himself out of darkness and finding to his surprise that it was not dark and that out of the windows he could still see the sunlit garden. Or perhaps, yes, uh, uh, as far as I understand what you have said, I suppose I must keep the ring and guard it, at least for the present, whatever it may come to me. Not only do Frodo and Thurston react differently to the information they find, they reach different conclusions about what they can do about the situation. Thurston concludes he can't do anything. He just resigns himself to dying, in fact. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansson went, so shall I go. I know too much, and the cult still lives. Now, in contrast, Frodo gets scared, and he realizes he may very well die. But he chooses to destroy the ring, and therefore take that slight chance that Sauron can be defeated. And when he chooses this, he and the other characters, they have some reluctance. They realize this is a very slim chance. But ultimately, they have hope. You see this especially at the Council of Rivendell, when Elrond responds to Frodo volunteering to take the ring into Mordor. I will take the ring, Frodo said, though I do not know the way. Elrond raised his eyes and looked at him, and Frodo felt his heart pierced by the sudden keenness of the glance. I understand aright all that I have heard, he said. I think that this task is appointed for you, Frodo, and if you do not find a way, no one will. Now these different conclusions, they highlight what is really the ultimate difference between these two stories. Their spiritual outlook is what's ultimately the big game changer. The Call of Cthulhu was written by a functional atheist. In a 1932 letter, Lovecraft described his religious beliefs in this way. All I say is that I think it is damned unlikely that anything like a central cosmic will, a spirit world, or an eternal survival of personality exists. They are the most preposterous and unjustified of all the guesses which can be made about the universe. And I am not enough of a hair splitter to pretend I don't regard them as errant and ne ne negligent. In theory, I am an agnostic, but pending the appearance of radical evidence, I must be classed, practically and provisionally, as an atheist. Now that last part may sound confusing. How can you be <laughs> agnostic but atheist? So let me clear that part up. An atheist says, I know that God does not exist. An agnostic says, 
I cannot ever truly know whether God exists. So Lovecraft admitted he couldn't definitively prove God didn't exist, but he did not believe in him. As a result, he did not believe in a benevolent God who runs the universe or intercedes to help people. So in all of his stories, what you see are people who either face these evil godlike aliens or these people who are gods, but they're like gods with no sense of honor or ethics. As a result, when Thurston finds out about Cthulhu, he has no hope of confronting or surviving him. His last statement makes it very clear he thinks Cthulhu will win. Uh, that should be, yes, it starts with what has risen may sink. Okay, what has risen may sink and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness waits in dreams in the deep and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. Thank you. John Stanifer sums up the hopelessness of Lovecraft stories very well in an essay he presented at the 2018 Lewis and Friends Colloquium. Lovecraft refused to give his readers hope of a happily ever after for humanity that he did not believe in. There was only the annihilation of the void at best. Now in contrast to Tolkien and his functional atheism, we have the Lord of the Rings, which is written by a Christian. And as a Christian, Tolkien believed in a benevolent God who organized the universe and interacted with it. Now granted, the Lord of the Rings doesn't have any moments where God physically shows up. There are no Aslan moments. But he hints that a benevolent God does exist in Middle Earth. Mostly he does this by scenes talking about prophecy, which raises the question, where's the prophecy coming from originally? Or he talks about what seem to be lucky breaks that seem to actually be something else coming in to help. For example, at the Council of Rivendell, Elrond tells everyone they have meant to decide what to do about the One Ring, and then he says the following. That is the purpose for which you are called hither. Called, I say, though I have mm. not called you to me, strangers from distant lands. You have come and are here met in this very nick of time, by chances as it may seem. Yet it is not so. Believe rather that it is so ordered that we, who sit here, and none others, must now find counsel for the peril of the world. Now if that's not clear enough, here's how Paul Kocher describes that Elrond speech in Master of Middle Earth. Nothing could be plainer than Elrond's rejection here of chance as the cause of the council, however much on the surface it may seem to be so. Almost as plain is his language pointing to the personal nature of the summoner. Words like purpose, called, Christ spoken, ordered, believe, look to some living will, and even have a distinctly Christian form. So the Lord of the Rings strongly implies that a God exists in Middle Earth. And Tolkien's later book, The Silmarillion, makes that explicitly clear and also establishes that this god created humans and other creatures as part of a beautiful plan. So, Frodo and his friends are cre creations by a divine being who intercedes to help good win over evil. Consequently, even though they, they, they know Sauron is huge and seems all-powerful, he mm. isn't. God is, and, and therefore they have the hope that they can defeat Sauron. To wrap things up, J.R.R. Tolkien and H.P. Lovecraft both wrote tales that show people facing incredible evil. And they both recognized human frailty in the face of this evil. But their different spiritual outlooks meant they reached very different conclusions about what humans can do against this evil. For Lovecraft, this leads to seeing an abyss, a darkness that has no end. Therefore, we can only resign ourselves to annihilation. But for Tolkien, this leads to seeing a shadow, a darkness that seems great, but there is a greater light beyond it. Therefore, we have hope. 